You know, I love a good campfire, but uh, Mike Fireburn, every time the campfires just get weirder and weirder and weirder. Hey guys, it's Paul, combat veteran, MMA fighter, YouTuber, and caffeine addict. And today, we are taking a look at a much requested video. This is the Bradley Gloves campfire story from Mike Fireburn. Let's get into it. Were you also required to clear up Bradley at one point? Why would they... Okay, I'm just going to point out, clear can mean a lot of things in the military. You can clear a room by removing it of enemies. You can clear a weapon, meaning render it safe for, say, storage. You can also clear, which means to out-process and be removed from the books. So, like, a soldier can clear through CIF and be out-processed, uh, but a weapon, a Bradley. So if someone said, hey, I need you to clear the Bradley, that would be something like the Bradley is still sitting administratively on the book somewhere, but it's already been transferred. I need you to clear that Bradley off. Or I need you to clear the Bradley because it says it's due for maintenance, but it actually isn't. So the military is kind of weird in that way, that the word clear can mean a lot of things. They call you a small arms repairman. Um, because technically... Because technically a Bradley is small arms? Yeah, technically, as far as the army is concerned, the M242 chain gun on the front of a Bradley is considered small arms. Good grief. So are 155mm howitzers. I... I... I don't think that's true. I think small arms are anything that can be operated by a person? Or a crew? Well, I guess, I guess, yeah, you know what? That would constitute a 155 round, yeah. So I guess anything else would be something like the, the gun on an A-10 or a tank. I don't know how much larger small guns can get. Well, I think their logic behind it was, well, it's small enough that a person could theoretically move it. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're right about the same. So it must be small arms. <laughs> Uh oh the truck broke down. Get our small arms repairman in over here. Yeah, a six-cylinder engine is kind of like a gun. I, I would tell the story about me having to clear the Bradley. I mean, if there's one thing that the military loves doing, it's that you should always use the best for the job. But usually that means the best available. And so if you have, all, if you have no mechanics, but you have a small arms repairman, then guess who's going to be fixing that five-ton? But it is a long story, and it kind of makes me really angry. So one night, I'm sleeping in my barracks. I love how he's like, this makes me angry. And like a normal person would be like, and therefore, I won't tell it. But when you're a military veteran, I think you just accept that the anger inside you from these stories is just, it's, it's just there. And it's never going to go anywhere. So you might as well share it with someone else. Room in Iraq. Someone comes and starts pounding on my door and wakes me up. Specialist, get up, get up. There's someone on the phone for you. All right, fine, so I go answer the phone, and it's somebody from one of the other companies, and they're telling me, we need you to come over to this gate over here and uh, clear Bradley. What do, you, what do you mean, clear Bradley? Well, we need you to come make sure that the main gun on this Bradley is cleared. Oh, there we go, okay. I mean, I can do that, theoretically. I haven't worked on one since I was in, like, job training, but all right, where, where's the gunner? Well, he's gone. Oh, no. This weapon is completely destroyed. Where's the driver? He's gone too. Where's the tank commander? He is also gone. Where was everybody out to- No, here's what I think happened. They want him to clear the gun on the wreckage of a Bradley. Like they have to bring it back. It's it hit an IED. It's being brought back to the base. And the weapon itself has been completely just torn, to sh torn up by this IED. And so they have to clear it. A lunch? They have to make sure it's safe to be brought onto the base. It's a valid point, right? Because imagine there's still a live Bradley round sitting in the gun of a Bradley. I might be wrong, but this point was is true ge as a general principle, right? And something happens, and that round cooks off inside a weapons, a, a Bradley, a destroyed Bradley vehicle that might be leaking petroleum or petrol or other fl flammable fluids. It may still have ammunition trapped inside of it, right? Especially larger, more powerful rounds, right? It, it, the recipe for a disaster is huge. When they said gone, I assumed they meant that everybody in this Bradley had been killed and they had towed it back to the gate. 
and that they needed me to come clear it before they brought it into the base. Because you can't just be driving a armored vehicle around with a 25 millimeter chain gun loaded on it through a base with people in it. Why not? You know somebody would be stupid and be like, look, I'm a gunner, ha <laughs> ha, and then they would just rip 12 rounds through the side of a building. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair. Or the barrel would be kinked and they would rip 25 rounds into their own hand. I mean, I've seen some of the pictures of people who uh, shoot rounds into jammed guns and the round blows up like in the chamber, and uh, it is gnarly. Fair enough. So the next day I found out from somebody else that what had happened is some of the people on gate guard had noticed that there was just a Bradley driving up and down one of the main routes by itself. Oh God. With no other vehicles with it. That, that's abnormal. They're normally part of a caravan, right? Yeah, they're normally part of a convoy. Yeah, so what happens, and, and things early in Iraq, when I was there in what turned out to be the midpoint of Afghanistan, um, the military realized that it couldn't have vehicles operating alone, right? They were sitting ducks. And so you would want the vehicles to be mutually supporting. So they would operate as convoys. And often in theater, they would have a minimum a minimum convoy size. So in our case, it was at least four vehicles, right? That means up to two could become disabled and still be towed by the other two and a minimum of 16 people. That means that each of those vehicles had could be operated driver gunner and uh tc the uh, uh, truck commander right and you'd still had a spare person in each vehicle right so it had an internal logic an internal redundancy um and but that was a lot and what's funny is that there's almost no military unit that has 16 members 16 soldiers as a standard uh what they call an mto platoon or squad so in our case we had to take we had three squads of tw of like 12 MPs, you know, and so we had to break them off and turn it into two what I called maneuver elements, right? So we had a squad leader who didn't really have a squad, and we had squad leaders who were leading other people's fire teams. It, it was weird, but that's sort of how it is, you know? Why is this Bradley driving around by itself? So they get in a Humvee, they drive out to there, and they find this Bradley... They have to get in its way because it, it keeps trying to drive away. It's so weird. They can't get a hold of him on any, on any radio frequencies. So they basically just park right in front of it and flag him down and take like 20 minutes to coax this driver out of the vehicle, reassuring him that, yes, in fact, they are U.S. soldiers and no, they're not going to try and kill him the moment he gets out of the vehicle. I, I'm still not sure why he was driving around by himself. Well, I'll get to that. This is so weird. This is, this is peak like 2005 iraq right like the rules were all off no one was even really sure if the war was just over or just sort of paused what happened was this bradley was part of a armored vehicle convoy that had driven through five different areas of operation and this bradley got hit with an ied everybody was a little shooken up but they were okay so they moved the bradley to a different spot in the convoy kept going it got hit with another IED. So they moved it to another spot in the convoy. They're just rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. It's and it got hit with another IED. <laughs> mm, this is this is actually not that uncommon, right? Early, early, uh, some IEDs would be command detonated. They would be detonated either via a cell phone or an actual command wire. And because, because the insurgents didn't understand how explosives worked they didn't really understand that targeting the biggest vehicle like the biggest vehicle destroying the biggest vehicle was the most impressive thing right like the bigger the vehicle the more impressive it is that you destroyed it the more credibility you would get as an insurgent right those sort of war trophies are seen as pretty essential in these sort of uh in insurgent movements right that's actually why um uh OBL, right? I think it's a it's an acronym. I'm not going to say his name. OBL in all the propaganda videos would carry a AK-74U, a Krinkov, and that's because it was that was only carried by Soviet helicopter pilots and tank commanders. And so by having one, 
he was showing to other like fighters and, and an ex Mujahideen uh, that he had presumably destroyed a helicopter or tank, right? And so that is part of that like cultural uh, flex. So that's why they would see something big and blocky like a Bradley. They would probably think it was a, a tank. It's it's not a Bradley. Doesn't have a, a like an indirect fire main gun like that. It's a troop carrier. Um, but they would see the Bradley and they would target it, not realizing that the five other tr- vehicles in the convoy are vastly less survivable, especially if they're still running around in Bradleys. So this is probably a 2005, right? Because they figured out Bradleys were just too heavy for the streets in Iraq, right? They kept destroying things. They, there were so many places they couldn't go. Everything was so narrow, right? So anyway, all this to say, that's why they kept getting hit with IEDs because they were, they were literally an IED magnet because they were so big and impressive. And the people in placing them did not realize that, they, that their IEDs weren't big enough to destroy the Bradley. It's still yet. At this point, this Bradley has been hit with three IEDs now. The gunner and the tank commander of this Bradley suddenly decide, you know what? Fuck this. I'm done being in this Bradley. So they get out of the Bradley and leave the driver, who is a 19-year-old kid and has never been outside the wire in Iraq before, in the vehicle by himself. And then they start the convoy back up. Ten minutes later, guess what happens? Oh, God. No. The Bradley gets hit with another IED. Okay, that that is so unbelievably poor leadership. Just so unbelievably poor. Like I can't I can't I can't imagine having that low level of integrity, right? Like I I just can't I just can't do it. I can't imagine leaving one of your junior most soldiers be, to, to like sit in this in the drive this Bradley because it's so dangerous like I get it maybe you have a squad of infantry in the back and you go hey we got to cross load the, this squad right they're just sitting there getting concussions again and again but you can't you can't just leave it to be one person this one is so bad that it knocks out the comms in the vehicle meaning that it, the driver can no longer talk to anybody else. The driver hits his head against the inside of the vehicle, gets knocked unconscious, and the rest of the convoy goes, he's got to be dead, and leaves. What? What? You just left a Brad? Yo. Okay, so, listen. In in 05 and 06 and 07, things were really bad. Really bad. Um... It was grinding on people a lot. And like that, like multiple IEDs in a day, that wasn't uncommon. And there were stories about units that would start to like refuse to leave the wire, refuse to go back out. They would say, this is pointless. There's no enemy. We're just driving around. We're not fighting them. We're literally just driving around and they're they're blowing us up. Like there's no war here. This is just us being targets in a shooting gallery. And... It, you know, it turned out they weren't wrong, right? That, that, that being blown up by IEDs did not actually help build the Iraqi government or encourage Iraqis to fight for their own country or serve any purpose other than achieve both a literal victory for the insurgency and in that they destroyed Americans, but also like the moral victory. Because every time the other Iraqis saw a Humvee or Bradley destroyed, they assumed that, that the insurgents were, were winning, right? Because you never saw an insurgent right the us would never like or the us generally would never like you know display dead insurgents or or or, or anything like that right so us victories were often quiet and insurgent victories were often loud so yeah a lot of troops again at that time in those really bad areas were starting to like you were starting to see that stuff where troops would refuse to go out they would demand rotations they yeah so leaving one of your 19 year olds to die to just dipping out when they're in a brad is is a real piece of shit move but you know yeah the the the, the thing to do would be one after the first ied you just you don't finish your patrol, right? Or after the third, just be like, hey, we're calling it in. This Brad has taken a lot of damage. 
everybody's concussed. We just need to go home right now. And because here's the thing. It's like, what? what? Yeah. The vehicle is still functional after being hit four times. And they leave him. Completely forgetting the first part of the of the soldier's creed. I will never leave a fallen comrade. They just leave him. Didn't even grab his dog tags? No, nothing. The rest of the comrade... And they left the entire Brad. Like, really? That, that convoy commander... It just totally, just totally screwed up. Boy just went, fuck it, Brrr, drove off. Driver wakes up. He's suffered a serious concussion. Doesn't know where he is. Doesn't know why he's in the si in a Bradley by himself. Doesn't know where anybody else is or why he's bleeding from the side of the head. Jeez. Can't reach anybody on the radio. The Blue Force tracker system is down, so he can't figure out where anybody else is. So he just starts doing the only thing he can think to do, which is drive up and down the main route all by himself looking for the rest of his convoy because he assumes there's no way they would leave me behind why would they leave me uh, oh this isn't this isn't funny this is just really upsetting i mean imagine being that kid like you know so it's fun it's not funny it's sad but it, it, it I, I, so they did a survey of soldiers who reported ptsd from their deployments and one of the largest i don't want to say predictors one of the largest correlates was that they also said that their leadership was like terrible, like toxic or lazy or incompetent or didn't give a crap about them, right? And on one hand, maybe it's like if you have PTSD, you're going to remember your leadership as being worse, right? Um, but it's also possible that I think, and there's some significant evidence to support this, that human beings become really, really, really brittle when they're isolated, like emotionally, right? So when you're cut off and isolated and you don't have any support, it's it's actually really easy to traumatize a person. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that you see during the past year and a half, the rate of mental illness, anxiety, and depression have increased a lot. You're also starting to see a lot more interpersonal violence. Um, I think that's all related. But the correlate, the, the other side, sorry, is also true, that human beings, when they are knit into these mutually supported networks, right, where they have, where you feel like you have people who really, truly have your back, that those networks can become mutually supporting. So that even when a person has a traumatic experience, right, they can sort of flex and bend and are more likely to either not develop the most severe iterations of PTSD or not develop PTSD at all, right? It, does this does this mean that if you develop PTSD like you didn't have enough friends? Of course not. Of course not, right? And but it's something that I think is worth exploring is the idea that you that there's a, a moral or like a social component to the development of uh, PTSD and trauma, right? And you got to think a lot of the traumatic events that cause PTSD type symptoms are often experienced entirely alone, right? They're usually like singular instances of violence. I don't know. I, I, I'd be curious to know if there's more research on it. Oh, the story's kind of dark. This poor 19 year old kid got left all by himself in the middle of Iraq because his tank commander and his gunner decided they didn't want to be in a vehicle that got blown up anymore. It seems so irresponsible to leave him there. It was incredibly irresponsible of pretty much everybody in that convoy. The fact that not a single person went, um, why are we just leaving Private Snuffy in this vehicle all by himself? I can only hope that the lieutenant or officer who was in charge of that convoy got his ass handed to him and got court-martialed and was never in a position of command ever again. Yeah. 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 This is hard. To, this is hard. This isn't even funny. This is just... It is incredibly reprehensible and is one of the reasons why I got out of the military. Yeah. One of the very many. One of the many reasons. But if you believe your leadership does not have your back, nothing else can redeem it. No pay, no benefit, no job change, no nothing. Because if you believe that you are, like, nothing, if you believe you're like dirt, to your leadership then 
there's 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 nothing there's no counter to that right your self-respect is the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning ultimately at the end of the day right like if you didn't have any self-respect then you'd be like hey i'll i won't pay rent i'll just live on the street you know like yeah i I, ultimately that's what it boils down to right and yeah if you don't believe that your leadership respects you then you have to retain your self-respect somehow. And the only way to do it then is to leave that organization. You know, that's one of the things I think we're seeing why so many Americans are resigning from their jobs. This uh, more, by the way, this month than ever in recorded history. Um, And I think a lot of it is driven by some of its inflation and chasing better jobs. But a lot of it is the fact that institutions asked more of their workforce than ever before right suddenly what used to be an exception right like like it was unusual that i was deployed and was expected to risk my life every day in exchange for all for ultimately for a job and like for my country and all that and patriotism and 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 everything and doing right by afghans but like ultimately it was a job and there is like a when you ask large swaths of Americans to take those risks, they have to, you know, again, like a grocery store worker who had to come in every day, like was risking their lives for the past year and a half. And so if you believe that your leadership doesn't have your back, that your leadership isn't in this with you, right? They don't have to be geniuses. They don't have to be organizationally brilliant. They don't even have to necessarily be like, like Captain America, rah, rah, like I know what to do in every situation. But you have to believe their moral compass points towards not sticking it to you as the person below them. And when you lose that faith, which I think a lot of people discovered that their health and safety and we're a team, we're a family here, you know, a lot of people I think came to the realization that that's that's just not true right yeah the military what zach had to deal with like maybe you know he was just ahead of the curve i have a similar story one time i was left in charge of guarding the toilets and uh, i used one of the toilets and i clogged it and i had to unclog it but we didn't have access to the supply cabinet so i cleared it manually oh god (laughs) just with your hands yeah oh that's foul you gotta do what you gotta do yeah i suppose so so it's kind of like the same thing for me uh yeah no getting left by your unit in iraq to die is totally the same thing as having to clear a toilet with your hands (laughs) we both suffered my main complaints are that most of the time the army was so disorganized and so stupid about what it would use its resources for it was just infuriating to me Sometimes military incompetence can be funny. Most of the time it's horrifying. Are- yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's that's also a function of just big bureaucracies, right? Uh, the Soviet military did the same thing. The Soviet economy did the same thing. Uh, huge companies do the same thing, right? If you Google the rise in BS jobs, you'll see that there's large corporations. Sometimes there's positions that exist entirely symbolically, right? Maybe two high-level VPs are like vying for, you know, preference or dominance in the organization. And uh, VP1 is like, hey, I'm going to open up a, a, uh, you know, creative uh research department right some 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 totally made up thing and then they hire a bunch of people and he goes ah i now have 150 people on in my department and the other vp goes i can't have that i'm gonna have my own creative widget marketing research department and then he goes no i have 200 people under my command and suddenly you have literally millions of dollars being paid out while these two uh narcissists can fight about how many people work for them so it's 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 how just big bureaucracies work also it's like getting them to talk to each other is impossible like just allocating even basic resources like who needs a vehicle who has a vehicle like just answering that question if you're in a big enough bureaucracy is really 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 hard our base sergeant major while i was in iraq had the biggest hard on for making sure that everyone still had their seatbelts on while they were driving military vehicles. He would sit outside in a Humvee 
on one of the main routes and stop convoys that were not part of his command or even his jurisdiction and walk up to each vehicle individually and make sure that everyone in the vehicle had a seatbelt on. Okay, I'm just going to point this out. If you're getting rocked with IEDs, guess what? That is actually like a life-saving compliance procedure. Now, how you do it is important because some of those convoys may not be pleased about being stopped. So you have to have a little discipline and a little, a little, what's the word I want? A little bit of a soft hand, right? Here's an example. Here's, here, okay, here's how the military would do it because they're, and especially it's sergeant's major. Sergeant's major just, there's just something about them that like they really were let, let loose for too long and not reined in. So here's how the, the military sergeant's major, this is what they would do. They would stop that convoy. They would say, we're doing seatbelt checks and I'm going to issue you a, they would have, they would probably make up their own form of a ticket and they would check everyone's seatbelt to make sure they're all plugged in, even like a lieutenant. And like some lieutenant would be like the convoy commander, right? An officer who, by the way, is superior, a, a, a higher rank than the sergeant major. Right, but a sergeant major just conveys so much respect that usually they just let this sort of BS go on, right? And so, and they would glare and they would write tickets angrily and be like, "Who's your commander? I'm gonna tell him you weren't wearing a seatbelt." Right? They would just use threats. Here is how me having done a whole bunch of other things since the military would go about it. What you do is you get a couple cases of water, you get a couple MREs. And you get a medic. And you see a convoy drive by and you say, hey, we're flagging you down. Hey, guys, listen, we are just running this checkpoint outside the base for convoys that pass. Um, we do some safety vehicle inspections. We also just want to make sure you guys got all the water, all the MREs and stuff you need. Our command requires it, right? So then every time the first part of the interaction it can be nice. It could be, hey, you guys okay on water? Casualties? Do you need to get screened for anything? Your guys all right? Hey, everybody wearing their seatbelts? Okay, cool. Hey, you don't have it? Hey, you got to put your seatbelt on, man. We've seen a lot of guys get their heads knocked, right? And what are they going to, like, right? They're not going to fight it. Why would, I mean, I get it, right? Seatbelt compliance is annoying, but yeah, it's, it's really, really just, it's just the military's way of doing things. is just like, it just breeds resentment. This Sergeant Major would have his driver park the Humvee in the exact same spot every day. And eventually, one of the local insurgents realized, hey, somebody parks a Humvee in this same spot every single day and shot the gunner in the neck. The insurgents killed the seatbelt checker? No, insurgents killed the gunner of the seatbelt checker because there's no fucking justice in this world. Ah. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. Whew. Oh, 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 five. Yeah, this is probably oh five, oh six, oh seven Iraq. This that was a, a, a total shit show. Ah. Our base also had this big old blimp. Ah, the blimp. With a multi-million dollar digital infrared camera hanging from the bottom of it. I'm sorry, did you say a blimp? Yep. yep. Big old blimp. Like the Goodyear blimp, but a little bit smaller. Nobody could ride in it. It just had a very expensive digital infrared camera that could see long distances. Instead of using the blimp to look outside the base and see if insurgents were trying to blow us up, our base commander used the blimp to look inside the base to make sure people weren't going over the five mile an hour speed limit. And make sure they were wearing their seatbelts. What a good use of resources. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so here's here's the ultimate problem. Here's Here's what the military's culture problem is that I think contributed heavily to us losing losing afghanistan and 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 let's be honest here losing iraq um the military at one point was a high risk institution it's an institution that had a high risk tolerance and they understood that failure was an intrinsic part of the system right so that's why you would see in world war ii for example it would be a normal thing to see commanders fired multiple times because you could be a good commander, but you could be not the right commander for that right mission. And if you didn't deliver results, then they would find someone who was capable of it. 
But here's the thing. They also acknowledge that, hey, you learn and grow, and you have a skill set that's right for something, right? And so you would see generals and colonels, they would get fired from commands two or three times and show up in different commands each time sort of the army like trying to dial their skill set in till it was right you know you would also of course see some of them would be fired but they wouldn't really be fired they'd be transferred to commands where their skill set was more valued right if you had for example medical logistics experience maybe you'd run a medical battalion but at some point the army would go yo dude we need someone to come back and help us manage the supply of medical supplies back here and we know you're suited to this so you're fired from your medical command and you got to come help us do this so that was but that meant that commanders could take risks one because you were probably gonna get fucking fired if you didn't if you didn't deliver mad good results you were gonna get fired and two you could always come back if you screwed up if you screwed up you would get another command and get another go at it right now the army changed culturally for some for some good reasons right that culture destroyed a lot of equipment and frankly created a lot of like abusive environments right but it also created a lot of innovation i mean look the idea that you were going to push soldiers out of a plane and have them parachute into into the uh, into the ground is is madness it's madness it's it, you would laugh me out of the command room if i proposed that today but someone proposed it 70 years ago and they were like okay this sounds reasonable right so the point is that the military right changed its culture they said listen now now we are an organization that tries to eliminate risk in every facet we can and so what does that look like well one officers are liable for any equipment destroyed under their command no financial limit right so there are a few cases of for example someone started a fire that destroyed like an entire fuel depot they owe the government like 10 million dollars they're on a repayment plan but thanks to interest and stuff they'll never pay it off um they'll just have their wages garnished until they die um they also fire commanders for single instances and the army explicitly says you have one shot at command right so you get one company command and then you're done you get one battalion command and then you're done so if you screw up if you have one mistake in your battalion command that is the mistake your career is over because the other thing the army implemented was up or out which says that you have to get promoted or else like within prescribed time frames or else we kick you out we start kicking you out and so the result of that is that if you're a commander you right let's say you take your company command as a captain you take some do some high risk stuff right you do some training that no one's ever tried before and it kind of goes gets screwed up right maybe even somebody gets hurt uh the army's gonna come and they're gonna be like you screwed up you screwed up you're fired that's it that's it your career is over you will not finish your time in service right because you didn't complete company command and you'll never get another shot so this is this and so the result is the people who end up on the top right they are the ones who are experts experts beyond anything you can imagine at never ever ever getting in trouble right and so here's the nice thing if an insurgent kills a soldier the insurgency did it it's a war zone right you won't get in trouble but if a soldier is killed in a vehicle accident that's something you should have controlled if they're speeding on base right so that's what they focus on they focus on preventing the things that will damage their careers or get them in trouble and winning the war is secondary to that right and this isn't my way of saying they're morally bad it's a way of saying the system is designed to incentivize this sort of strange behavior where war fighting is secondary to not getting in trouble at one point i was issued a belt fed machine gun i don't know why i think probably because somebody in my chain of command was mad at me <laughs> so they gave me an m249 because they were like fine make him carry around this 13 pound piece of shit mm -hmm. i discovered on a firing range that if you use this machine gun while wearing Nomex shooting gloves, there was the potential that the glove could get caught in between the trigger and trigger guard. 
thus making the machine gun continue to fire even when you release the trigger. First, I actually talked to my chain of command and said, hey, this is really unsafe. Can I cut the trigger finger off of my Nomex glove so that I don't accidentally have a runaway gun and shoot somebody? Was the Nomex glove issued to you? Yes. Ah, you can't do it then. Well, no, they were issued to me, but the, the Nomex gloves are considered an expendable item. They don't expect them back. Oh. Okay. Yeah, but the military hates non-uniformity. Nothing is more offensive to the military than non-uniformity, and cutting the fingers off a glove is way too, way too not uniform. Okay. And they said, you know what? That's a really excellent safety concern, specialist. Thank you for bringing that up to us. Why don't you go ahead and do that? And I went, okie dokie. So I cut the trigger finger off my Nomex glove. Well... A bunch of other people saw me running around with a glove that had one finger cut off of it. And they went, that looks cool. So mm. they cut all the fingers off their gloves. Oh, God. brilliant. <laughs> and then literally the next day at formation, everyone got yelled at because a bunch of people were going around cutting the fingers off their Nomex gloves. And their excuse was, yeah, but I saw Specialist Zack do it. So that means I can do it too. Specialist Zack had a legitimate safety concern. You guys are just freaking idiots. Whoa. It's nice to have a story about your leadership that doesn't exemplify how stupid they were. Hey, yeah, I, that was exactly my reaction. He beat me to it. Nice. I felt validated. Ooh, guys, that was that was pretty good, man. That was pretty good. And by good, I mean extremely triggering. Um, yeah, I really... I really... Don't like hearing those stories, actually. Um, I get it, man. Uh, 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 you know, Iraq in 06, it did. It felt like you were targets in a shooting gallery. You just, there was no fight to be had. You just drove around until you got blown up. There was no strategy. Um, there was no winning the war, right? It, 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 it was people that didn't want you there. But, like, to, to take that out on 19-year-old soldiers... Um, Man, I hope they I, I hope they get fucked and die. I hope whoever did that fucking hates themselves, right? It's a kid, man. It's somebody's kid. And when they're with you in your command, they're your kid, right? You have to protect them. That's what the, what the, what the hell's the point? What's the point of all this other crap they give you if you don't if you don't look out for people, right? Nobody wants to be a nobody you know why nobody respects all those like, crusty soviet generals because they treated their conscripts like conscripts right that's why nobody likes the north korean generals right it's because they their conscripts are just conscripts you know in america we think that there's a there's an intrinsic value to to, to your soldiers right they're citizens and their soldiers right that's how germany views their military members that's how the uk views their military members right as as being something other than just cannon fodder and if you lose that, if you just become fixated on your selfishness and your narcissism, um, you, you, you're not you're not any better. You're not any better than the the worst class of person throughout history. You know. Anyway, guys. Um, yeah, hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, sorry, it wasn't quite as as funny as they usually are. Um, first off, first off, I have new mugs. As you can see, I have a gas mask mug. Um, also have another mug that says Combat Veteran Gaming. Uh, and ch check the merch link down below. Second, if you want to become a channel member, that's that join button right next to the subscribe button, uh, which you should also hit. Um, channel members get access to exclusive rooms on the Discord, and they get to submit and vote on which video I react to on Friday. Um, or for this channel, it'll actually be Saturday. I'm changing the schedule up a little bit. Um, and um join us on the discord the discord itself is free right it's really active it's a lot of fun and we are growing uh really rapidly actually i think we have like 1300 1400 people on there now so yeah uh other than that guys oh and check out the podcast i have a podcast the combat veteran breakdown it's the link is down below you can listen to it on spotify but really it's most popular venue is right here on youtube i do like a video version and it's the exact same as these these videos but i do deeper dives into kind of issues and news of the day so you should definitely subscribe if you have good ideas for topics or even guests you'd like me to see uh try to get on there let me know in the comments on that video and yeah other than that thanks so much for watching and i will see you next time